Hello, everybody. Welcome to the final episode of the Antibody Society webcast series on antibody validation. In this, the 10th episode, we look at how commercial affinity binding reagents may look in the future. The Antibody Society is an international non-profit association. We're a forum for facilitating discussion, disseminating information, providing guidance, and assisting in the training and advancement of students and postdoctoral fellows. If you care about antibodies, please join the society. The speakers in this series are expressing their independent assessments and are not representatives of the society. Viewers can write in questions at any time during the broadcast for the speakers to answer, and they'll remain online for 15 minutes after the cast has ended to answer any questions. In this episode, I once again welcome Dr. Andreas Pluktoon from the University of Zurich. In the first cast of this series, Andreas explained the features of the various forms of antibodies. But of course, he's also been intimately involved with the invention of many important antibody technologies, including making antibody fragments in bacteria, the ribosome display technology. He's founded several successful biotechnology companies focused on affinity binding reagents. And so it's a very great pleasure to be able to have him give the final webcast of this series. Greetings, Andreas. Thank you very much for joining us today. Andreas, you've evaluated and developed many novel affinity binding technologies, molecular tools with comparable diversity to antibodies, but with valuable additional properties. Could you please tell our viewers about why you think these rather than antibodies may become dominant in the future? Well, thanks very much, Simon, also for bringing together this series of webcasts. So what I would like to do in this webcast is talk about the role of non-antibody scaffolds as binding proteins in research. And so I think we all who are listening to this webcast are convinced that for biological research, we need specific binding agents. And as we have heard over the last nine webcasts, historically, these have always been antibodies. Initially, these were anti-sera or polyclonal antibodies. Then later, antigen purified polyclonal antibodies came along. And then in the 1970s, monoclonal antibodies hit the stage. And then much more recently, maybe 20 years ago, recombinant antibodies. And we've heard at great length about the importance of quality control for specificity. This is what this whole series of webcasts is all about. And as we have also heard in the previous webcasts, this requires application-specific testing. And what I'd like to say right at the outset, this doesn't go away, no matter what we use as affinity reagents. So this is also true for this section. So in other words, uh, quality control and quality control for specificity and application-specific testing is always necessary. Now, the development of these recombinant technologies for antibodies has ironically made us independent of using antibodies as binding agents, because we only need two ingredients. We need a repertoire or a library of variants of a binding protein, can be an antibody library, but doesn't have to be an antibody library. And we need a selection technology, something like phage display or similar, that connects a phenotype to a genotype. And that's schematically shown here. So we have here four binding proteins. Typically, a library would have up to 10 to the 12. These have different colors, different shapes of binding sites. And what is shown here is schematically a ribosome display, where each of these binding proteins is made by the ribosome and the corresponding mRNA, which encodes the protein, has the corresponding squiggly line in the same color. And so what is schematically shown here, any, by any protein can be converted into a library and the selection technology needs to couple the phenotype, in other words, the protein and its binding site, to the sequence that encodes it. And as I said, this is 
schematically this example of ribosome display. Now, what is so powerful about these in vitro technologies is the fact that we can directly select for specificity. So, if we have an antigen in yellow here, which is connected to a biotin, we can pull out the desired binder um, with magnetic beads binding, carrying a strap davidin and uh, binding the biotin molecule, pull out the desired binder, but also we can add competitors. We can add similar molecules, the orange ones, that should not be recognized in large excess, of course not carrying a biotin, so if these are, for example, an isozyme or some post-translation modification, a similar state of the same molecule or conformer, the ones that, the, the binders that would recognize yellow and orange would be deflected to mostly binding the orange and not be selected because the orange is in excess, uh, whereas the ones that are specific for the yellow would be the ones that would be pulled out. And this is the reason why these in vitro technologies are so powerful to select for um, specificity and counter select against the recognition of similar molecules. Now, as I said before, in principle, any protein can be converted to a library, but of course there are some that are better than others. And here are shown these examples which have made it to the clinic. So there are probably 500 scaffolds that have been published in the literature, and this is just a series of the ones that have made it into human patients. And so these are obviously very stable molecules that have given rise of to, to high affinity binders, specific ones that are considered good enough to be used uh, by injection in human beings. So that's obviously a very, very high um, hurdle and, and sort of says that um, these, these technologies are good enough to really be used in medicine. Now I want to just uh, illustrate this with examples on the DARPINs, which stand for Designed Anchor and Repeat Proteins. And just for that people get an idea, um, this is the molecule that comes around and we will see now that it binds, the green is the DARPIN, the cyan is the target. And, and it shows that one can select binding surfaces which, which are extremely complementary to the target. And this is one of many, many crystal structures which by now have been obtained. And that explains why they have such high affinity, high stability, and they can also be produced at very high levels in bacteria. Now, this picture illustrates a comparison of such a scaffold protein to a fab fragment. What we see on the left-hand side is the molecule from the side. And what we see on the right-hand side is to see the binding site from the viewpoint of the antigen or of the target protein. And what you can appreciate is that the actual contact surface is very similar. In the fab fragment, actually, the coloring is bigger because this colors all possible ways where they can bind. Um, but in reality, the actual surface that is used turns out to be very similar. And that's the reason also why the affinities at the end of the day are very similar even though the underlying architecture of the protein is of course completely different. And the fab fragment consists of two chains and the great majority of scaffolds consist of one chain. And many technologies have been developed over the years to making them multivalent, multispecific or chemically modify them. And this is again summarized here. So one can, of course, use monovalent fragment. One can put two together with a flexible linker. These can be the same or they can also be different. One can put them together head to head or tail to tail, give a different geometry than over here. 
one can put more than two together, for example, four different ones, they can all be the same or all four be different. One can put a spacer in between, for example, push two receptors apart on the cell surface, or one can link them in a particular angle to put, for example, two receptors to force them to come together in a particular angle. All, all of this has been has been realized and just sort of shows what one can easily do with recombinant molecules that can be easily manip manipulated in E. coli. Furthermore, since these are all individual proteins of which one has the gene, it's also very easy to modify them. One can introduce a non-natural amino acid anywhere in the sequence, uh, for example, for click chemistry, an amino acid that carries this azide group, or introduce cysteine anywhere in the sequence to have a site-directed labeling at any place one desires, or put a put a, a, a tag at the end, like an AVI tag, which is enzymatically biotinylated, such that they can be immobilized in a directional manner on the surface. And so these are obviously all recombinant proteins, and so therefore we can actually focus on two different types of applications. First, we can take advantage of them as proteins, which can be easily modified. But secondly, we can also think about applications where we take advantage of having their genes. And I'd like to take you through them one by one. So let's first of all consider applications that require pure protein. That is essentially very similar to all the webcasts we had before, um, meaning applications such as ELISA, fax, immunohistochemistry, Western blots, and so on and so forth. In these cases, we need the protein. But I think there is also a great interest in those cases where we need lots of protein which would be very expensive with traditional antibodies and I think where access to these inexpensive reagents can really make a, a difference. And just to uh, highlight applications where you need the gene, um, this could be for example expressing the proteins on the surface of a cell or of a virus or expressing them inside a cell or fusing them to other proteins, fluorescent proteins, enzymes, cytokines, and I'll um, highlight a little bit of this uh, a little bit later. So what about secondary reagents? All people working with antibodies know that, of course, over the decades, secondary reagents have been developed that allow the antibodies to be detected in many applications fluorescent or um, with magnetic labels or whatever. And these tend to be other antibodies that bind to the constant domains of the primary antibody and uh, exploit species specificity. And the recombinant agents, of course, don't typically don't have any uh, constant FC part. But this is not a limitation because the recombinant molecules can all be tagged. Um, they can be provided with a short peptide sequence, for example, a his tag, a flag tag, and an H tag, and a, a spectrum of orthogonal detection tags is available, and of course, um, generating uh, reagents against these tags is, is equally um, convenient. And this, in other words, uh, allows them to be detected just the same. So let's uh, focus on applications requiring pure protein. And, and so I like to ask the provocative question, why would one ever use anything else but antibodies? And I think the obvious answer is there's only one reason, if it can enable things that are hard to do with the current molecules. And now you'll ask, well, aren't antibodies perfect molecules for all applications? Well, maybe not. Um, antibodies, as I had mentioned before, are expensive to make at large scale, 
And this is a significant limitation for applications where large amounts are needed, tens of milligrams, let's say. Um, and one example that I think is, is quite prominent is immunopurification. So in other words, um, the idea has been around for uh, several decades to make chromatography and put antibodies on the beads. But since this is so expensive, the antibodies are randomly coupled, this is actually rarely used. The idea, I think, has been first published something like 50 years ago. Um, but I mean, it is still an uphill battle um, to do this, and with with recombinant anti with recombinant reagents such as, for example, DARPINs, which are inexpensive, one can literally uh, throw out such a, a column after one after one time use. This is this is not expensive because the reagents basically don't cost anything. A second example is structural biology. Um, there's a lot of work that has been done over the years in using antibodies as crystallization chaperones, but again, this is expensive, hard to do, the screening is difficult, and so on and so forth. And by now, um, a lot of examples have been created where these non-antibody scaffold proteins have been used as crystallization chaperones and for those who are interested in there are some references where uh, such such work has been reviewed and i think again this is now a very standard technology that is uh, very easily accessible finally uh, let's focus on logistics if one had the possibility of um, providing millions of specific binding agents, how would this actually work? So hybridomas that, that produce antibodies are expensive to store because you have to store them as frozen cells. And if a clone is lost, the antibody may be gone forever. Uh, in other words, the whole value is to keep the cell that produces it alive. Now, as we have heard in the, in the previous webcasts, traditional antibodies are not only undefined, as their sequence is not known, but they become, can become extinct. And that's, a, that's an issue. And I think science shouldn't be like that. We should have a permanent record of, of what has been done. Now, the binding reagents based on scaffolds produced in bacteria, they do solve these problems because they, by definition, always have known gene sequences that immortalize these reagents. So in other words, they are stored as sequence files, and even if the freezer thaws and um, the clone is lost, as long as the sequence is recorded, it can be quite quickly resynthesized on demand also at, at several places in the world, um, and the expression is, is inexpensive. And so this gene information then um, enables easily subsequent production of, of, of novel constructs, fusion proteins, and so on and so forth. Now let me show some examples that can only be done if one has access to the gene. And the first example is the expression of binding proteins on the surface of cells. And the example that's shown here are T cells, where, of course, chimeric antigen receptor um, have become very popular. And this is an example that actually has been really created in reality. It's a chimeric antigen receptor with specificity against three different tumor antigens. In principle, this could also be done with um, SCV fragments in, in uh, concatenation, but in reality, um, they then tend to aggregate, and with these stable, stable scaffolds, which don't aggregate, um, this tends to be more robust. A conceptual similar example is to express such proteins on the surface of a virus code and thereby redirect the virus to specific receptors that are recognized by the recombinant proteins that are put on the surface. This is the example of an adeno-associated virus. Uh, in the case of 
the adenovirus. This has been done slightly differently by creating an adapter that uh, recognizes the knobs, but the idea is the same, that now the virus has been equipped with binding proteins that redirect it to a different target. And so therefore, again, this is something that is um, conceptually easily accessible, but one really needs to have the gene in order uh, to do this. The third example is to express these binding proteins inside the cell. And again, this is something you can only do if you have access to the gene. And this allows functional studies of, of various kinds. On the top is shown a Drosophila embryo where um, one binding protein has been um, labeled with GFP and a, a target and, and, and coupled to a degrader. And um, whenever the green is expressed, the red is degraded. And so you see this beautiful alternating pattern. And a lot of very, very insightful studies in developmental biology can be done by the, by the ability to now express such proteins in the cytoplasm as fusions to, for example, a fluorescent protein. And they still, they still function, they fold, and they um, can be used to, to study biology. The bottom example is, is a sensor. This is a DARPIN that recognizes specifically the phosphorylated form of, of the kinase ERK. It doesn't recognize the non-phosphorylated kinase ERK. And so this has been fused to a dye. The DARPIN has been fused to a dye. The fluorescence increases whenever it hits its target, phosphor ERK, but not when it sees ERK because it doesn't bind that. And so what this does is it actually recognizes where in the cell the phosphorylated form of ERK is. And what you can actually see there, it's in the nucleus, as one would expect. And actually it is enriched in the nucleolus. And this is something one can see with such experiments. These are just examples of what one can do by having these folded proteins um, inside the cell. Again, um, with SEVs, this can be done in principle, but only a fraction of them uh, fold well inside the cell. And so therefore, I think that's another niche for these uh, robust uh, scaffold proteins. So now you will ask the question, if this is also great, why can't we buy more of these reagents? And the reason, as I'll try to explain, is all commercial. These scaffolds proteins are all patented. The patents will expire over the next few years. And the scaffolds have all been commercialized, but have been used almost exclusively for therapy. And the reason is very simple. The profit margin is much greater for therapeutics than research reagents. And so therefore, the reason that we can't buy many of such affinity reagents currently is purely commercial. Uh, for the reasons that are shown here on the left-hand side. And since they are used for human therapy, this emphasizes that they are at least as specific as antibodies, because obviously the regulatory authorities um, apply very, very high standards uh, to show that they are safe and efficacious. Now, you might ask, what can we do if we want them today? I think Practically all the scaffolds have come out of academic labs. Many of these academic labs offer centers for academic collaboration, where reagents can be made for particular scientific projects. For those who are interested, they find a center of the University of Zurich, but other places may, may have that as well. And one has to see how the commercial landscape will develop um, if and when more of those are really um, available through commercial centers. So let me try to draw some conclusions. Binding reagents should be uniquely identified by a sequence, and that goes for antibodies and non-antibody scaffolds alike. Um, and I think we all, as researchers, take it for granted that genes and plasmids are sequenced, the sequence is known, and clearly this is technically possible for binding reagents and that uniquely identifies them and, and puts a barcode on them 
and makes them uniquely um, identifiable for the future. And binders from synthetic libraries, whether they're antibodies or non-antibody scaffolds, by definition, will always have a known sequence. And this makes them molecularly defined, reproducible, comparable between researchers and labs, makes them immortal, because we can always resynthesize them, makes them easy to be distributed, simply as, as data files, and they can be expressed at any site in the world. And of course, this is, this is uh, very important to stress that again, quality control is, all, is always still necessary. None of this actually replaces quality control. These are just additional advantages. The second set of conclusions is by having access to the gene, you have many additional advantages. In other words, it opens research to many other areas. The binders can be expressed, for example, on the surface of cells. I showed the example of CAR T cells. Can be expressed on the surface of viruses, for example, for, for retargeting viruses for gene therapy. It can be expressed in the cytosol or in organelles um, as reporters or as inhibitors, and thereby really study very fundamental biology. And the third set of conclusion then goes to non-antibody scaffolds in particular. They routinely provide today binders of at least the same affinity and specificities as, as antibodies. They have been validated in clinical trials, and to reiterate this once again, extreme quality control is applied by the regulatory agencies, otherwise this would have never been allowed in humans. And in research applications, they are attractive because they can be produced very cheaply in high quantity, uh, in high yields in E. coli, most of them. So examples, for example, uh, applications, for example, in structural biology and biotechnology become accessible. Affinity chromatography, as one example, uh, becomes very attractive, but other examples in structural biology as chaperones, for example, become accessible as well. Um, because they are made in E. coli and can be easily conjugated and modified, um, as they have only one chain, often no cysteine, lots of things can be done in a very defined and orderly way, which is, uh, for, for in many cases, far more difficult to do with IgGs, where one never knows exactly how many and where they will be uh, modified. And most of the scaffolds that, that have been um, validated uh, typically fold well in all environments and can be functionally expressed in the cytosol um, or as fusions to many other proteins. So I think there is a there is a bright future and we have to see how fast this is taken up by the community. But I think this is what I wanted to summarize here. And at this point, thanks very much for your interest. Thank you very much indeed, Andreas. Uh... Yes, a, a wonderful overview. So uh, last week, uh, Andrew Bradbury explained to us why recombinant antibodies are more desirable as affinity binding reagents, even when compared to classical monoclonal antibodies, which many users I'm sure still consider to be a kind of gold standard format reagent. In particular, he focused on the reproducibility and identifiability of recombinant antibodies. And you described many of the advantages of alternative background, backbones over antibodies in your presentation. Yet alternative binders are still uh, ra rather rare in the catalogs of commercial affinity reagent suppliers. So perhaps scientists are resistant to using reagents that are relatively unknown compared to antibodies. Uh, what do you think the role of alternative binders uh, is given the dominance of classical antibodies at present? Yes, as I tried to explain in the presentation, I think this is this is sort of a cause and effect uh, problem. In other words, the, the, the very fact that they are um, not as, as widely accessible in catalogs, of course, means that binder, that, that um, uh, 
interested researchers have to go through other through other sources such as for example the academic centers that provide them and so therefore um, this this is this is a part part of the reason and the reason that they are not so not so widely commercially available is entirely is is entirely the profit margin that all the companies that have been set up to to make them have all without any exception gone into therapeutics and so therefore of course um, completely neglected the, the research antibody market and so i think this is something that will gradually change and as i as i try to to highlight um i think the the fastest ad, ad, adaption of, of of this technology will be in those applications where you where you clearly need the gene where there's simply you cannot do the experiment without having the gene and then of course the application decides on whether a recombinant antibody or a recombinant non-antibody scaffold is more advantageous and i think that that depends a little bit on on what exactly one is trying to do great thank you very much indeed andreas Andreas' talk concludes our webinar series. We've heard how antibodies are a source of irreproducibility in biology and the disasters this has caused. Some commercial antibodies can be hard to identify and they may be ill-defined in molecular terms. The suppliers may not be the producers and they may have relabeled them. Their activities can be hard to identify because the suppliers may offer a data sheet that refers to an ancestral antibody, but sadly not to that batch you have in the tube you've just purchased. The suppliers may not have even tested the reagent they're selling, but you can always ask them directly if they've tested it. We learn that tools like the RRID system and Cytab and Anti Antibodypedia can help you reliably identify appropriate antibodies to use. But even if you can identify the reagent you have bought, you, the scientist, must confirm that it has the binding activity you expect in the experimental context you're using. It must be fit for purpose. And so you must always use appropriate positive and negative controls to verify its specificity and selectivity. Genetic knockdowns and knockouts currently offer very good negative controls, while multiple positive cell lines or tissues expressing various level of the target combined with native or denatured protein arrays seem good ways of controlling specificity and selectivity in the experimental context you're using. Experience shows that, sadly, when you do this, you may well find that many of the antibodies you purchase are non-specific or non-selective in your experiments. But personally, I think it's better to ensure that the reagents you buy and use do what they claim, and of course, what you're going to claim when you report the data using them, rather than you creating chaos in your research and in the literature. As we've seen, this can waste tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, euros, pounds, and renminbi. We've seen that even routine techniques, standard techniques, like Western blot and immunohistochemistry have to be used and interpreted cautiously, especially when you're trying to get meaningful quantitative data. Finally, we've seen that only recombinant antibodies can be defined by their primary sequence, just like most other biological tools are. And so in principle, they are both immortal and entirely reproducible and should be favored but they're big proteins and expensive to make. There are alternative binders, which are small and versatile and can be made in economical bacterial cultures. And as we've heard today, these may well be the future of commercial affinity binding reagents. Despite all these cautionary tales, antibodies remain amongst our most valuable biological tools, and we will not soon be turning away from them. So we must make sure that the reagents we use and the data we report using them are as reliable and robust and repeatable as possible. As we've seen, there are in fact a lot of tools available to help users to correctly select and validate antibodies. It's simple 
And as practicing scientists, you must make sure that the data you report is not distorted by bad antibodies. I'm Simon Goodman, and this was the Antibody Society webcast series on antibody validation. We would like to thank all of our speakers once again for so excellently explaining the complexities of antibody validation and you, our users, for having joined us during this series. We hope you found it useful. The webcast would have been impossible without the generous support of our many corporate sponsors. Andreas Pluktum will be online for the next 15 minutes and will be happy to answer any questions you may have. If you have any questions on the future of specific detection reagents for Andreas, please type them in at the question and answers tab.